these are some of the oldest landscapes known to man, where rocks formed as the planet began to cool almost four and a half billion years ago. Ancient zircon crystals found in the Murchison, 700 kilometres north of Perth, have already shared some secrets of Earth's creation. But it is the skies above which scientists believe will reveal the beginning of the universe. The Square Kilometre Array is the astronomy world's next great hope for understanding how the universe was born and evolved in those earliest years after the Big Bang. This is an existing prototype of the Square Kilometre Array, or SKA, a $3 billion project to build the world's largest radio telescope. Imagine thousands of these antennas clustered across the landscape. Backed by 15 countries, the telescope will be built in two locations, one part in South Africa and the other here in Western Australia. The Murchison is an ideal location for radio astronomers because it's so empty. The 50,000 square kilometre shire is home to just 115 people. Everything we do these days, our, our mobile phones, our cars, our refrigerators, everything generates radio frequency noise. And so basically we have to put our radio telescopes further and further away from people. In WA, three spiral arms containing 132,000 radio antennas will stretch for 65 kilometres across the landscape. It will centre on what used to be Bellardi Station, a former cattle property purchased by the CSIRO in 2009. We think of light as travelling incredibly fast and almost instant, but because the universe is so big, it does take long periods of time for that radiation to get from one place to another. And so the light we're receiving, in some cases, has actually taken billions of years to get to us. So yes, in a sense, we are looking back in time. Another comment that was made to me was uh, the, you might come across some aliens. Is that even possible? Look, it, it might well be. I think a lot of why the public likes astronomy is not only the absurdity of our numbers, but I think for many people in the background is that we might discover you know, extraterrestrial intelligence. So it, it's always possible, yeah. The region is home to proud traditional owners and pastoralists. So how does another entirely different land user fit into an already complex mix? It's something that's already started. An Indigenous land use agreement was struck with the Wadjuri Yamaji traditional owners to create what's known as the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory Area on Bellardi Station. And in 2010, the CSIRO began building telescopes, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, or ASCAP, the precursor to the SKA. The CSIRO purchased Bellardi Station in 2009. It paid just under $5.5 million for the 340,000 hectare pastoral property. It also negotiated an $11 million Indigenous land use agreement with the Wadjuri Yamaji traditional owners. That was to build what's known as the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory Area. It's an area on Bellardi where science and research projects are already taking place. But in order to build the Square Kilometre Array, the CSIRO needs to negotiate a new land use agreement with traditional owners. Construction of Stage 1 of the SKA is due to begin on paper next year, with Earth turned in 2022. But before then, a new and much bigger land use agreement must be reached. With CSIRO wanting to develop the SKA project on Bellardi, we have an obligation um, to protect our sites, protect our history, be able to pass on to our younger generation um, <clears throat> due to the importance of um, the country and the sites. Along with leading negotiations on behalf of traditional owners, Anthony Dan is contracted by the CSIRO to conduct heritage surveys where the SKA is proposed to be built. But how to build 132,000 antennas in a way that doesn't restrict access and causes minimal disturbance to significant sites is complex. 
is it called compromise or is it shared intention? So, you know, looking back to the beginnings of, of time, um, there's a lot of correlation to, well, looking back to the beginnings of, of culture or at least um, a current example of the oldest continuous culture on the planet. And that's how, that's us. And so, you know, you can't destroy one to try and say that you, you know, you're, you're making progress in another. I, 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 I do believe they should be held in the exact same regard. For Dwayne Mallard and other traditional owners negotiating the land use agreement, supporting a project that looks back to the beginning of time shouldn't harm the oldest continuous culture on the planet. They feel obliged to protect and preserve their culture, land and dignity. It's worrying me if they're going to damage it, you know. And that's why I said, I said to them, if it's going to happen like that, I, I need to move off. I don't want to see it getting damaged because I'd like to be... You know, like to see it as it is and go back to it when we can. You know, we're not going to go back into the country that we've been doing mustering and going out and camping and stuff like that. They seem to want to keep everybody out by the look of it. But they said they're not going to, but that's a word. Len Merry is being treated for cancer, but refuses to move to town. He'd rather stay in his home at the remote Pia Wadjuri Aboriginal community. Even if I got to die, I'd rather die out here, not, not in town. Because the country I'm leaving is going to worry me. He doesn't want the SKA built on his ancestral lands. The project is a divisive issue. Unfortunately, you know, the way the, 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 the system's set up, it, it creates a lot of division between the Wadjuri people, whereas you know, back in the day, there was no... The division realistically wasn't there um, because everybody was aware that, you know, this particular part of country belonged to particular people and they have the right to... And if you wanted to go into that country, you needed to be granted permission back in the day. You, you couldn't just wander in there and just do what you want. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the almighty dollars changed a lot of things. So this isn't about money for you? Oh, definitely not about money for me. If I had my way, I, I, would, I would like to leave the country the way it is. So you don't want the SKA here, ideally? Oh, my preference is that we, we don't have it here. The CSIRO says traditional owners won't be locked out of the SKA site. The land use agreement essential to building the SKA is due to be complete next year. I think the negotiations have been uh, pretty robust, to be honest. Um, you know, there's clear opinions on both sides, and I think we're very close to reaching a final agreement. Ant Schinkel says Wadjuri people are leading heritage surveys of the proposed site for the SKA, recording locations of archaeological and ethnographic artefacts. These are very carefully recorded and noted, and we then work with the Wadjuri very carefully to make sure that we come up with alternative locations. So the SKA telescope design does allow some level of relocation. The actual area of the um, MRO that will be impacted by the telescope is extremely small. It's well under a tenth of a percent of the land will be impacted. And basically all of the, the, the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory will still be absolutely available for the Wadjuri to exercise their native title uh, rights. Uh, and they have um, basically unfettered access to that. Ant Schinkel says the land use agreement will include construction supervision, jobs and training for local Aboriginal people, assistance to develop businesses and a cultural awareness and education program. One of the key things needed for radio astronomy to work properly is radio silence. A radio quiet zone has been declared on the SKA site and that reaches into parts of the Murchison. It's 520 kilometres in diameter and within it, things which could cause interference like cars, CB radios and mobile phones are banned or restricted. There's no phone signal in the Murchison, so this phone box is essential for local communication. The prospect of never having a mobile phone network across the Murchison frustrates people, like pastoralist and Shire President Roscoe Folkes-Taylor. 
I get the feeling that if Syro weren't in, t weren't in the area, there would be a tower here by now because it is a bit of a no-brainer. We get a lot of Mount Augustus tourist traffic and it is, yeah, like I say, 300 one way, 200 the other way to, to, to a tower. The other thing is, we as a community, we wish Syro would put a bit more energy into compensating, use what word you like, getting us up to speed. We, we reckon something really good would be a fibre line across to the Merchant Settlement. That would be fantastic. Have you asked them about that? Yeah, a couple of times so far, so we'll see how we go and we'll keep on working on that. Or some alternative, Joe. Some alternative, you know, a little bit back. And they've, they've given things back, but hmm, with the staff turnover, it's a bit hard to keep track of where you are with some of these commitments or promises or maybes or whatever. Bands used for mobile phones are regarded by the CSIRO as one of the most problematic for noise pollution for radio astronomy. The CSIRO says it's still seeking a compromise with the Shire about the imposed lack of mobile connectivity and talks have included a proposed fibre line running from the SKA to the Murchison settlement. We, we have to be acutely aware that small numbers doesn't mean not important. And so one of the things we're trying to make sure we take on is that the small number of people that live in the Murchison Shire, which is partly, of course, what makes it so attractive for radio astronomy, also need our support in their, their ongoing day-to-day -day life. David and Francis Pollock run a tourism and cattle operation on Woolene Station, adjoining the CSIRO's Bellardi Station. About half of Woolene is in the radio quiet zone. The Pollocks and other neighbouring station owners we spoke to are frustrated with what they say is a lack of clear communication from the CSIRO on what is and isn't permitted within the zone. The, the answers that they give are generally uh, very grey and I think that you know they don't know the answer and I think that CSIRO are so risk adverse that they're, they're practically paralysed to add to any um, practical sort of questions that they don't have an immediate answer for. Things like uh, the use of drones, uh, electric fences, and particularly for the future, uh, the use of uh, virtual fencing, which I think has the capacity to, you know, completely revolutionise pastoralism out here and mean that it's much easier to manage these properties, um, especially from an ecological point of view. Um, but it seems that virtual fencing is, is, uh, is not going to be allowed. Ant Schinkel explains the radio quiet zone works in layers. The primary or most sensitive zone is 140 kilometres in diameter. And we're working quite closely with the pastoralists through the Murchison Shire, for example, to look at each type of emerging technology and work with them to say which ones might be problematic, which ones um, won't be problematic, or which ones could be developed slightly differently so that they work well for the pastoralists and for us. So some of the feedback on that, Ant, is that it is quite difficult to get a clear-cut yes or no when those questions are asked. Uh, it, well, it, one of the problems, of course, is um, harking back, uh, the, the telescopes are so sensitive, it's sometimes very difficult to understand exactly what signals they may or may, may, or may not receive and, and, and how much it might affect the data. So it sometimes takes us quite a while to work out, is this piece of equipment really going to affect us or not? Um, so I, I'm sympathetic to that. It can be a bit of a process to go through. This year, regional WA is enjoying a spike in visitor numbers. Closed Borders has seen travellers stay within the state and explore their own backyards. But in the Murchison, some pastoralists want tourism to keep booming. The industry has become a vital part of station income. Along with hosting guests on her property, Frances Pollock works with eight local governments in the region to develop what she describes as a tourism industry with massive growth potential. For the Pollocks, the Radio Quiet Zone has pros and cons. They have provided accommodation to CSIRO workers and other researchers working in the zone. And no mobile signal appeals to some guests wanting to disconnect. It is a slight conflict trying to keep people away, but I don't know, we want to bring people out as well. And the SKA in itself actually is an attraction. I mean, we get a lot of people coming out here because they want to go and see it. 
Um, but as it stands and as I see it will always stand, they're not allowed to go out to the SKA. So you are already seeing that curiosity there, people wanting to have a look. Yeah, and it, it's quite amazing really. Obviously, the SKA being built on Bilardi Station and it, it's our neighbour, as we describe it like that, the SKA is our neighbour. Um, yeah, I, I don't often talk to many people that don't know what it is, even if it's just in general conversation. I mean, guests to the property often ask about our neighbours, you know, how do we all fit as a community? Um, everyone knows about the SKA. They seem to have heard it, the acronym. What does that stand for again? Um, and of all those people, there is at least one a week that will ask me, can we go out to see it? We'd like and then when they realise it's next door, it's like, oh, it's just next door. Can we go and visit it? And it's... Yeah, unfortunately not. And then look, there are obviously certain tourism products that I feel as a result of the Radio Quiet Zone probably will never have the opportunity to establish out here. Things like, I don't know, like maybe helicopter flights or, um, you know, scenic flights just in light aircraft. Um, there's some things that you just won't, won't do well out here. Francis Pollock and the Murchison Shire believe an SKA interpretive centre should be built in the Murchison settlement, an idea that's been discussed for years. And while he's still working out what could be built where, Ant Chinkle believes the CSIRO has an obligation to communicate its science. We will encourage uh, people coming who want to um, see and learn about the SKA and the other telescopes to go to the Murchison Settlement, to go to Geraldton, um, and perhaps even in Perth there'll be outreach. So we're still very much in the phase of planning these, but we do rec recognise the requirement for a, uh, a tiered approach to this, um, starting with the actual region. How to best keep a quiet zone quiet in a region with a growing tourism industry is a delicate balancing act. It's a matter of how you manage that, um, both in terms of location and time for activities. Um, so, so there's you know, lots of learnings we've, we've got from other facilities around the world here. And while travellers are curious and the science community is excited about finding new stories in the night skies above the Murchison, for people like Glenn Merry, those skies are already precious storytellers. Sometimes you lay down at night and you look up at the stars, there's a lot of story to that as well. Thank <laughs> you.